Kepler by Chris X, read by Casper Alexander. Kepler, 1677b. Alan Lovo and his beautiful wife May sip glowing cocktails on the balcony of a massive floating airship, Excelsior. They bathe in the golden light of two bright yellow stars, enjoying their expensive week-long getaway on an alien planet. Massive creatures with fur and wings glide above thick, fluffy clouds and giant trees. May finishes her drink and waves at one of the small aliens in a tuxedo. It slithers up and snatches her empty glass. It yips and shakes the cup at her. No, I don't need another one, thank you. She turns back to her husband. They're so strange looking. Like a furry octopus. Ew, no, they're cuter than that. Should we go gliding now, before the lines get too long? May excitedly grabs his hand and leads him away. Alan, unlike his wife, had not always been wealthy. He built his fortune designing aircrafts. For him, this life of luxury was new and he had every intention of living it to the fullest. Every expensive cocktail, every five-star meal, and any tourist activity he could find. May, however, was raised in a family of politicians and business executives. They owned the debts of several first-generation space colonizers, debts that only seemed to grow with interest. Space travel was nothing new to her. In fact, her parents owned a controlling interest in this particular intergalactic cruise line. Despite their different upbringings and beliefs, the two lovers cherished every moment together. And on this alien planet, away from their hectic lives, they were finally able to find some peace. Hand in hand, they make their way through the ship's winding corridors. Half an hour later, they're fitted and zipped into sleek, aerodynamic suits, standing on the roof of the massive ship with a handful of other guests. Okay, everyone, gather around. Their guide corrals the wealthy tourists in a circle and addresses the group. I hope you've all been having fun. You're about to experience a once-in-a-lifetime adventure. Something you can only do here on Kepler-1677b, the most beautiful place on this side of the cluster. They all cheer and squeeze into their helmets. Can you hear me? You look sexy as hell in that jumpsuit. Alan gives May a thumbs up. Um, we can all hear you. We're all on the same radio channel. The tourists laugh and their helmets buzz with a dozen voices. All right, all right. Let's try to keep the chatter down to a minimal. Their guide walks up to the edge of the ship and peers over at the vast jungle below. The atmosphere here on Kepler is 36% oxygen. That's why the trees and animals are so large. But more importantly, it means we can do this. He leaps off the ship and plummets out of sight. Small flaps on his suit expand and propel him upward. He rockets over the ship and does a superhero landing down on the deck. The crowd claps and cheers. Now you try. Alan and May run past the crowd and leap over the edge. They hold each other, hurtling down into the bright orange sky. Here we go. They extend their arms and let the wind launch them high above the oversized green forest. Later that night, Alan steps out the shower and dries himself off. That was amazing. It always is. <laughs> that too, but I meant flying. I've dreamed of that since I was a kid. May wraps her arms around him. I told you you'd love it. Let's go up to the pool so I can do a few laps before we go to sleep. Sounds good. I could use a nightcap. They get dressed and make their way back to the upper floors. The twin suns still shine high in the sky. It's still sunny. 24 hours of sunlight. That can't be good for us. May laughs. laughs. 
That's why you're not supposed to spend all day out here. She dives into the crystal clear water and does a few laps. Alan lovingly watches her body glide through the water for a bit before heading to the bar. He stares at the moving menus and then points at a blue bubbling cocktail. I'll take that one. The Oort Cloud, coming right up. The multi-limbed robot blends liquids and powders, shakes them up, and serves the sparkling liquid in a frosty cup. Is this safe to drink? Alan studies the neon bubbles. It's perfectly safe for human consumption. You're probably just programmed to say that. I am. A sudden murmur breaks out behind him, and he turns toward the commotion. Half of the rooftop deck is staring up at the rapidly shifting sky. One of the suns had almost doubled in size, its orange surface bubbling with a bright red. Hmm, Alan thought to himself. Maybe that just happens at night. He walks back to the pool and greets May, who is drying off. What's going on? She looks up at the sweltering air. Is this normal? I didn't see anything about this online. Well, it is an alien planet. It's eerie. The sky was not completely red. The smaller orange star, caught in the orbit of its stellar sibling, starts spinning faster. Locked in the dance of death until the behemoth fireballs collide in an eruption of color and heat. Chip cheers in amazement at the once-in-a-lifetime cosmic light show. Every known color litters the sky. Their excitement quickly turns to terror as a smaller sun slowly disintegrates, devoured by its larger twin. All at once, everyone on the deck has the same idea and chaos ensues. The frantic mob tries to claw their way through a door, but the electronic lock sputters and gibberish floods its screen. We're stuck! One of the tourists tries to smash the thick glass door with his bare hands. High above them, the surviving massive star continues to grow and pump heat down on the planet. The solar panels that line the outside of the luxury starship overload. Sparks shoot out and they explode sending burning chunks of glass and metal sliding off of walls and onto the screaming guests. Get it open! Alan uses the largest piece of metal he can find to pry open the door. The crowd shove and tumble their way in, eager to get a breath of fresh air, but the heat follows them. May pushes past the robot assistant spinning in place, shooting sparks out of his mouth and eyes. She grabs Alan's hand, and they take off down a dimly lit hallway. The mob of people behind them trample each other, trying to escape the heat and find help. Finally, Alan spots a human crew member standing in a roundabout, directing traffic. What the hell is going on? Yeah, we want answers. Are we in danger? Settle down, everyone. We're experiencing a natural phenomenon. Please make your way to the escape pods and follow emergency protocols. This way. May pulls Alan's hand. What? I know where the escape pods are. May never flew without checking the aircraft's safety rating and emergency manual. Her family has several lawsuits against them for reckless endangerment due to their cheaply made aircrafts. They push past a slew of screaming families. Two more floors! May yells on their way up. Alan taps on his glitching wrist pad. I don't even know where we are. They rush past a ballroom, casino, garden, and a spa on their way to the back of the ship. Let us in! Several angry guests scream at the crew. They shove and point fingers, but they firmly hold their ground. We're sorry, but the escape pods are having some technical difficulties. This is bullshit. 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 bullshit! The crowd starts throwing anything they can at the crew's head, and a fist fight breaks out. Get out of the fucking way! We have to get to the roof! May yells over the fighting. As they turn away, a passenger manages to crawl into an escape pod and fire it. 
The bay doors only opened halfway, and the metal paw slammed into them. The explosion rocks the ship and spews flames onto the crowd. Fires break out on several floors and pieces of the already collapsing ship tumble into the jungle. Burst pipes drain sewage into million dollar suites and the understaffed crew scream desperately into faulty radios. May and Alan emerge onto the large rooftop and look up in shock. The sky is now a dark sapphire blue. The massive star looks more like a bright moon. You bastards! May points towards the large landing pad scattered around the roof. Several other ship's captains and managers are packing themselves into their own private aircraft. Let's go, let's go! Hurry up! May and Alan take off running. They're leaving us! When the captains see the guests from below trickling out onto the rooftop, they start packing faster, shoving their friends and valuables into their aircrafts and slamming the doors. Before the tourists even make it halfway, the fleet of expensive vehicles take off an abandoned ship. No! How, how can they just leave us? May looks around for an extra ship, but the roof is empty. Alan looks up at the bright blue sun. It's blue. That's better than red, right? It should only be yellow. Alan holds out his hand and fills the air. It was warm, but not sweltering. It doesn't feel that bad anymore. The mob of people around them suddenly gasp and cover their eyes in horror. May grabs Alan's arm and points up at the sky. The private aircrafts above them try to breach the atmosphere, but the surges of energy pulsing from the blue star stalls their engines. They spiral and smash into each other, raining down debris on the alien jungle. Satellites and other spacecraft succumb to the waves of energy and fall through the sky like a million shooting stars. Thick white tendrils lash out from the expanding sun and beat against the small planet. The solar flares expel a heat so intense the clouds evaporate. Trees burst into flames and a thick smoke drifts up from the dense jungle below. A loud, desperate roar echoes from the forest floor as a thousand animals try in vain to escape. The roof of the Excelsior goes silent. They huddle close to one another terrified by the sounds of a dying planet. Finally, what sounds like thunder fills the air. Electricity crackles all around them, forming a storm of lightning and fire. The ground trembles and the sky grows brighter by the second. Alan pulls May close and looks into her eyes. I love you. I'm happy I met you. May looks up at the swelling star. They say we're all just stardust. Maybe we're returning to our natural state. So what was all this? Were our whole lives just a fluke? May closes her eyes. Whatever it was, I enjoyed it. The bubbling blue surface of the sun cracks and a brilliant white wave washes over the planet. A hurricane of heat and light pours down upon them, evaporating water and eviscerating flesh. The last thing they feel are each other's arms. The death of the star is seen from millions of light years around. Kepler 1677b 
disintegrated, nothing but loose atoms in a field of dazzling color. Gold, silver, carbon, iron, and all the building blocks of the worlds we know adrift in the cosmos, soon to be life once more. The only thing that ever was, is, and will be stardust. Yo, this is Chris X. Thanks for listening. Go to www.coolcats.shop.